Okay guys, let's talk about excess post-exercise oxygen consumption, sometimes referred to by the much simpler acronym EPOC, that stands for Excess Post-Exercise Oxygen Consumption. So on this graph we're going to show uh, how oxygen consumption, that is the amount of oxygen we take in and use in the body, how oxygen consumption can change when we exercise, what causes it to go up, what causes it to come down, um, and how oxygen consumption relates to the demand for oxygen as we exercise. So let's start off by identifying how much oxygen we need whilst we're at rest before we even begin any exercise. So here on the graph, this purple line, nice and low down on the on the uh, on the y-axis, uh, shows us that we're not taking very much oxygen in whilst we're at rest. And we're going to say that approximately 3.5 millilitres per minute per kilogram is roughly the standard for uh, for adult humans um, across the board because this 3.5 millilitres of oxygen um, per minute is per kilogram of body, body weight. So therefore it's going to, uh, we're taking into account the different sizes of, of human bodies. Um, and pretty much all of us come out somewhere around about 3.5 millilitres of oxygen being consumed per minute for every kilogram of our body weight. Um, and actually there is a term for that, um, that volume, that 3.5 millilitres per minute per kilogram, um, and that is one met. M-E-T, capitalised M-E-T, one met is 3.5 millilitres per minute per kilogram. So we, we're consuming one met at rest. And, and because we're doing no exercise, there's no extra demand for oxygen. So we're ticking along quite nicely at 3.5 mils per minute per ki kilogram. Now let's say that we uh, got up out of our seats and we started uh, running or rowing or cycling or, or some um, demanding aerobic activity. The demand for oxygen placed on us by that activity would shoot us up in terms of oxygen consumption. So the purple line represent, represents the demand for oxygen. So how much oxygen would be needed in order to perform whatever it is we're doing at 100% aerobic capacity. So providing all the energy for, uh, for this exercise. Let's stick with rowing as, as an example. So we've been sat in the boat, we've not been doing anything, we're at rest. Then suddenly we begin to row and we begin to row at pace um, and we, we're trying to get going quickly and we're moving at pace and we're going to try and maintain that pace for a few minutes. Well, in order to do that entire thing aerobically, we have a very high aerobic demand for oxygen. And during the exercise period, that, that demand, let's say for sake of argument, um, rowing demands somewhere in the region of um, 42 millilitres per minute per kilogram of body weight. So we shot right up in terms of the demand for oxygen to perform that exercise 100% aerobically. That's how much oxygen we'd need. And then we let's, let's say we row for several minutes, six, seven, eight, nine, ten minutes, and then we stop. We get to the end of the race, or we get to the end of the, the row. Uh, we stop, and then the demand for oxygen, um, because we've sat still, again, the demand for oxygen drops back down to resting levels. Okay, so this is, this is theoretical stuff. Okay, we'll, we'll complicate it in just a moment. Let's say we drop back down to resting levels because we're sat in the boat doing nothing, just like we were before we started exercising. So during that recovery period, the demand for oxygen, um, in order to meet the demand of what we're doing during recovery, would be about 3.5 millilitres per minute per kilogram, or one met. Now, as you're well aware, and you're probably already thinking, this is far too simplistic. This really doesn't account for what actually happens. So what does actually happen? The first thing that we need to remember is as we discussed with the aerobic system, because it's a complex system and takes a while to get going, well, this red line on our graph represents the actual supply of oxygen. Purple line represents the um, perfect scenario if we could supply 100% of the oxygen immediately as soon as you start exercising. That would be the purple line. 
to meet the demand immediately. We can't actually meet the oxygen demand immediately at the, at the drop of a hat, as it were. We have to take the body takes some time to get us up to the point where it's supplying sufficient oxygen to meet the demand of the exercise. And the red line shows as a curve that eventually um, we can get there. Eventually we can get there, provided it's not mega high intensity work. We can eventually get there, but it takes a while. And during that period of time, we are utilizing our other energy systems, our anaerobic systems. So that's the ATP, PC system, and also the lactate system. We're using those two systems to make up the shortfall in energy uh, demand because we can't meet the demand 100% aerobically. So we have this red curve that represents how much of the demand we're actually meeting aerobically. And then there's a, there's a, a deficit, what we call an oxygen deficit. Now, the oxygen deficit changes and reduces, as you can see on the graph, as we go through the exercise, as we approach getting to the point where we're supplying sufficient oxygen for the exercise to be done entirely aerobically. Up until that point, we have what we call a deficit. And that's simply the distance between... Um, the actual amount of oxygen we're supplying or consuming uh, and the demand for that oxygen. So it's a, it's a gap between, if you want to think of it in these terms, a gap between supply of oxygen in red and the demand for oxygen in purple. So eventually, as the, as the graph suggests, eventually we can, provided again, like I say, it's, we're not talking about super high intensity stuff, um, eventually we can reach uh, a steady state or what we might call um, exercise homeostasis. Exercise homeostasis, where we've got to the point now where the body is consuming sufficient oxygen. The system has kicked in, it's running efficiently enough, our breathing rate has increased and so on. So we're now supplying sufficient oxygen with a faster beat of the heart, uh, greater stroke volume and so on. We're now supplying sufficient oxygen to meet the entirety of the demands of the exercise. And that's when we get to a steady state or exercise homeostasis. But by this point, we've already created, having had this oxygen deficit run for, a, for a, a several minutes or however long it's been, we've created what we call an oxygen debt. So that oxygen debt is the amount of oxygen we would have used if we could have done the whole thing aerobically from the first moment we started. We can't do that. We have to use the other anaerobic systems to make up the shortfall in energy. So therefore, we've got this amount of oxygen that we would have used had it been available to us immediately as we started the exercise. So that, that space there between the purple and the red represents the oxygen debt. Now, the critical thing to understand um, and to know about the epoch is excess post-exercise, that's after exercise, we continue to consume additional oxygen. Why? because we have to pay back the oxygen debt. So that additional oxygen goes um, to pay back the debt that was created. So that gap, that differential, that difference between the red line and the purple line whilst exercising, that has to be, it's almost as if we've taken that out of the bank and we've got to put that back in. We've got to put that oxygen back into the system. And so we have this, um, we have this curve that shows our oxygen consumption returning during recovery, returning down to resting levels, but certainly not immediately. And you know this after you've run a race or, or road or, or any kind of exercise um, that's required aerobic activity, you continue to have an elevated breathing rate after you've finished. You continue to have an elevated heart rate. And that, the reason for that is the body is trying to continue to supply additional oxygen in order to pay back the oxygen debt. In a moment, we'll talk about the specifics of what it is that it's doing by paying back this debt. But let's just speak in general terms for now. We're paying back the debt that we created, what we drew out of the bank of energy, if you like. And we've got to pay that back. And we need to pay that back by supplying additional oxygen that's above and beyond the demands of sitting still at the end of a race or lying down uh, on the floor at the end of the, at the finish line. 
Um, that doesn't require much energy. What requires the energy and causes us to continue to consume excess oxygen post-exercise is that we have to pay back the oxygen debt. Now, interestingly, the epoch, this, this paying back, uh, this post-exercise oxygen consumption, this paying back comes in two parts, two parts. So we actually split it in half. And the first thing that we pay back is what we call the fast component of epoch the fast component and essentially this relates to paying back the oxygen debt that was created by the use of the ATP PC system and then once we've paid that debt back or focused initially on paying back the debt of the ATP PC system so that can be replenished then we pay back the debt that we created by use of the lactate system so we use those systems to make up the shortfall in energy because we couldn't get the oxygen in quick enough. But now we're at rest, we can continue to supply the oxygen to break down, for example, the byproducts of um, using the lactate system. So we have a fast component which focuses on paying back the oxygen um, that's required to replenish the ATP PC system. And we've got a slow component which focuses on paying back the oxygen required um, to break down the, the negative byproducts or the byproducts uh, of the lactate system. So let's be slightly more specific. Let's be slightly more specific about what we mean by paying back the debt. What is actually happening? What is actually happening with that excess oxygen? Why are, what is it doing once we get that excess oxygen in during the fast and slow components? What is it actually doing? And I've, I've there's lots of things we could talk about here. I've got going to narrow these down to three things here. So first of all, um, during the epoch, that additional oxygen is being used to replenish stores of oxygen, both in the blood, so blood oxygen levels, and also importantly, the stores of oxygen in the muscle. And you'll remember from previous videos, oxygen is stored in the muscle uh, with a protein called myoglobin myoglobin is where that oxygen is stored in the muscle it holds on to that oxygen and that myoglobin gives up that oxygen when we exercise when we're not quite meeting the full oxygen demand of the exercise some of that oxygen is taken from the muscles and used so we need to put that back so that's the first thing that happens the second thing that happens is the lactate that has built up in the blood needs to be broken down now when we reach the steady state one of the things to note about the steady state is that essentially what that means is the lactate that's being produced is being broken down essentially as quickly as it's being produced however the lactate that was produced during the oxygen deficit or as a consequence of the oxygen debt that has to also be broken down and so the, there is some debate about how this happens um, and there are some criticisms of this idea of epoch um, but that's not this video is not really the place for that. Um, you need to kind of understand the, the, the basic concept of, of, of what's happening and what the, what the theory behind the epoch is, at least. So let's say let's stick with it for now that lactate in the blood, um, that's excess lactate caused by the oxygen deficit. That excess lactate now needs to be broken down. And as you know from previous energy system videos, it is the presence of oxygen that breaks that lactate down and then um, buffers it essentially and moves it around and makes it useful again uh, for energy um, and then the final thing is or at least the final thing that i'm going to include here is the resynthesis of glycogen from lactate okay so again the lactate that's built up uh, during the oxygen debt as a consequence of the oxygen debt is uh, is broken down but resynthesized into glycogen and you remember that glycogen is the stored form of sugar and where does it get stored? Well, predominantly it gets stored in the liver. So what happens during the epoch? We reoxygenate the blood, we reoxygenate the, the muscles and the myoglobin in the muscles. Um, we use that oxygen to break down lactate in the blood. So blood lactate levels start to come back down to homeostasis levels, to, to resting levels. And thirdly and finally, we resynthesize glycogen, a stored form of sugar and put it back into the liver ready for another bout of exercise. Well, I hope that's been helpful in understanding what excess post-exercise oxygen consumption or EPOC is all about. Thanks for watching.